This kid is no angel, but he's not a kid anymore. White boy Rick Wershey Jr. is a free man. 32 years later, the youngest FBI informant is out of prison. The controversy behind his sentence. You know, when he's described as a model prisoner, a model prisoner doesn't commit additional felonies in prison. I mean, I think that's just... Plus, a surge of federal officers in Portland, Chicago, and Albuquerque. A crackdown on crime or protests. Plus, how the suspect in the shooting of a federal judge's son and husband is possibly tied to more crimes. And a wild chase across the streets of Fort Lauderdale. You don't want to miss it. We were trying to push him in there, in the yard. Long Crime Report, diving in today's true crime and top legal stories. It's Thursday, July 24th, 2020. All right, welcome back to Law and Crime Report. My name is Bob Bianchi. I'll be your host today. It is July 23rd, 2020. Guys, if you've seen the movie White Boy Rick, I believe played by Matt McCona McConaughey, um, is a story that's very, very unique about a young man who was 14 years old when he became an FBI informant. And then as a juvenile, got involved in some drug-related activity that ultimately led to a 32-year sentence out of Michigan. We have a really special guest with us, Scott Bernstein, who's an author, an investigative journalist, a historian, a person who actually wrote a book about this but was covering the story and ultimately gave a lot of the source materials for that movie, White Boy Rick. Uh, and that's Rick Warshaw. How you doing there, Scott? Thanks. Thanks for having me on, Bob. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah absolutely. So, uh, listen. Our audience has got to know. Tell us what your involvement was this, and how did you get to a place from being an investigative journalist and a historian? Why were you following this case? What were your thoughts in the beginning, and where did it? How did it wind up later becoming a movie? Well, I, you know, I, I take credit for breaking this. The what I call the second part of the story, uh, the 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 explosive narrative that Rick was recruited out, directly out of eighth grade by the uh, FBI and DPD and and put to work as a drug mole uh, in some very very dangerous and powerful Detroit uh, organized crime groups and was on the government payroll for two and a half years got paid close to seventy five thousand dollars was encouraged to drop out of high school um, and to 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 fight drug gangs on, on behalf of the FBI. And the DEA ended up uh, calling him the most important informant in the history of uh, the Detroit DEA office. Um, and then once he outlasted his worth for the federal government and they sucked him dry for information, they made all the busts they could make based on the information that he provided, uh, they decided to, you know, put him in a cage and throw the key away. Um, he until he walked out on Monday, he was the longest serving nonviolent juvenile offender in American prison history. Yeah, and you know, it's amazing because most juvenile court systems are there to try to rehabilitate the juvenile. Punishment usually isn't something until you become 18 or older as an adult. So if I understand this, he was an informant. He had no reason to be an informant from the age of 14. He was actually going in at the behest of the FBI, making undercover buys, building cases, like you said, the most significant prosecutions in that jurisdiction for a while. But he did get himself a little jammed up when he was about 17, which ultimately led to the charges that were against them uh, for the sale of, I believe, about eight kilos of cocaine. Is that correct? It wasn't, it wasn't sale. It was possession. And I just want to um, emphasize, because I think the narrative's got it twisted over the years, that, uh, you know, he wasn't brought down on a kingpin statute. He wasn't brought down on a, a continuing criminal enterprise. He wasn't brought down on a RICO. Uh, he served 32 years in prison on a routine traffic stop. I mean, that that's where this arrest stems from. Uh, he rolled a stop sign in front of his grandma's house in May of 1987. And within that traffic stop, the police found uh, eight kilos of cocaine, and he was sentenced to life in prison under a very draconian law that's been off the books for 20 years. And every single person convicted under that law was released within five years of it going off the books. But because Rick was Rick, 
and was really a political prisoner. Um, there was a lot of people in the federal government in Detroit, in the Detroit bureaucracy, the establishment, that just, you know, that he had information on or had given information on their friends, got their friends locked up, uh, because he also uh, helped build the, the, the biggest uh, bust against the uh, a dirty ring of Detroit cops that had the, the, the city of Detroit had ever seen. And uh, so he had he had enemies on, on both sides of the law, and they didn't want him to see the light of day. And he was serving a, a, a life sentence. And luckily, there was enough of a groundswell of support uh, based on my reporting over the last 10 or 12 years that, you know, pushed the story out of Detroit and, and got people, uh, you know, really asking questions. Why, you know, why are we behaving like a third world country and, you know, politicizing law enforcement and, and putting our political enemies behind bars, even if they were 17 years old when they were uh, uh, arrested? But playing on what yeah. you asked me about, him leaving the uh, uh, getting off the government payroll. They cut him loose in uh, late 1986. He'd been working with them since mid 1984, uh, and yeah, he went and became a drug dealer. That's all he knew. They, the, the government taught him how to be a drug dealer. White Boy Rick was a creation of the U.S. government, and then in right. you know a, a couple months, he he took that traffic stop bust, and that was the end. Right. So, I mean, a traffic stop bus is often something that happens. It establishes probable cause. Eight kilos of cocaine isn't for personal use. It's usually with the intent to distribute. Nevertheless, he was still a juvenile. He had given significant cooperation. As you indicated, he uh, stepped on the toes of some powerful political people along the way. And he winds up getting caught in what I, even as a former prosecutor, a head county prosecutor, well, these mandatory sentencing laws. But what I also found interesting about his case is some of those major drug kingpin people that he put away served substantially less time than he, this juvenile, had to spend it. Tell us about that. To give you context, the, they sent him undercover when he was 14 into an organization known as the Curry Brothers Gang, run by uh, Johnny Curry. It's the biggest kingpin on the east side of Detroit from the late 70s until he was busted in the spring of 1987. Johnny Curry was married to Mayor Coleman Young's niece. So he was very tied in to uh, uh, the politics of Detroit of the era, as well as having a lot of inroads and help from the police department. Uh, Johnny Curry was busted in 1987 because of Rick's cooperation. And Johnny Curry's been out of prison for 20 years. 20 years! Johnny Curry's been in prison, or has been out of prison since 1999. Right, and substantially lesser. And we always talk about that in the criminal justice system about parity, P-A-R-I-T-Y. And it, it really makes no sense. And one's a juvenile, one's a drug kingpin. One helps one get convicted, yet that guy gets a substantially less sentence. He gets 32 years. Obviously, something's not right there. But what I found interesting is that you guys work so hard, both with your investigative journalism and many other people, that there was an actual retired FBI special agent that testified at a clemency hearing, because there have been a number of times that clemency went before the governor to say, uh, bringing out all the things that Scott's bringing out, enough is enough. This, this is crazy. It's hitting a fly with a sledgehammer. You're warehousing a 17-year-old boy that made a mistake, sure, but does the punishment fit the crime? Let's take a listen to the ironic twist to have a law enforcement, former law enforcement agent, an FBI agent, actually testifying on behalf of the defendant. But his 30-year sentence for a nonviolent uh, offender makes no sense to me. Uh, I believe, uh, in part, in a large part, uh, the, the reason for this is because of his cooperation with me on public corruption matters. Uh, after Mr. Worship, when I first met him, he, uh, his father was an informant for the Bureau in Detroit. I met him, he was about 15 years old. Uh, his father actually used him as a source of information uh, for which his father was paid. As a result of Mr. Worshi's uh, cooperation throughout the years, uh, he infiltrated uh, the Curry Drug Organization in Detroit. This is a very violent, uh, large-scale drug operation. As a result of his involvement, 20 of the members of the Curry Drug Organization were arrested prosecuted federally, and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Johnny Curry, the leader of the gang, served 13 years. He is out. 
Yeah, I mean, there, there, there you go. That gets to the point. A leader is out and this juvenile is in. Was there any good investigative reporting at all or any facts that were developed by law enforcement? Because, you know, when you've been doing this long enough and you see a disparity like that, uh, a juvenile being sentenced to a 32-year sentence for a mistake on a particular day after all that cooperation, everyone knows something's rotten in Denmark. Uh, did anybody ever kind of figure out who was the person behind perhaps pressuring that he get that sentence and continue to serve it? Yeah, it was coming from the a loyalist to Mayor Coleman Young, who was the mayor of Detroit for 20 years, the most powerful politician the city of Detroit had ever seen. And he disliked Rick. He, and publicly, uh, he bashed him as a stool pigeon because Rick had helped take down uh, a big part of, uh, you know, this dirty cop ring in Detroit that was tied directly into the mayor's office, that was tied into the police department. Uh, another one of his enemies was Gil Hill. If people know the, the movie Beverly Hills Cop, he played Inspector Todd, who was uh, Eddie Murphy's boss in that in, in those three movies. He was a, the, the homicide commander in Detroit, and Rick had given information on a cover-up of a murder of an 11-year-old boy, which is still an unsolved murder right now. Uh, came happened in 1985, and Johnny Curry, admits to giving Gil Hill a payoff. And Rick gave information to uh, the government about that, and it eventually hindered Gil Hill's mayoral hopes. Gil Hill ran for mayor of Detroit in 2001 and lost, and he blamed the loss on Rick because of those allegations came up to haunt him again. Uh, Gil Hill died in 2016, and within a couple months, all of a sudden, there's no objection from the Wayne County Prosecutor's, off uh, prosecutor's Office objecting to his parole, which they had been objecting for 30 years. You know, I, I say this a million times, Scott, it's, it's just a mantra of mine. I do not believe in the election of district attorneys and judges, because I think it has a corrosive effect, especially in the area of politics, is which is what you're mentioning right now. And on that note, let's listen to Governor DeSantis, who's the person who would be giving clemency, listening to the hearing, after the retired FBI agent who actually worked with Worshi uh, spoke on his behalf. Let's listen to the governor. He was committing crimes in prison, correct? I mean, in the early 2000s, um, he was involved with a multi-state uh, auto theft ring that was moving stolen cars and cocaine from Miami he up to Virginia. So he had been helping you guys and then turned around and engaged in additional criminal misconduct. And that's the reason why he's, he's in Florida prison, correct? That's true. Okay. That's true. I, mean, I, think, I appreciate I think, though, his like help, Mr. but I Kotkamp think Camp said you need to take a look at the totality over the last 32 years of everything that he has done and contributed. Uh, I, this... I think that's fair, but I think that um, you know when he's described as a model prisoner, a model prisoner doesn't commit additional felonies in prison. I mean, I think that's just he's, I, he's I think it undermines had... the case to try to say that. He's I mean, never you gotta... had any tickets while he's been in prison. He's never caused any trouble. The, due to the Witness Protection Program, he's been transferred to 13 different prisons, and each and every time he's been transferred, I've received telephone calls from the, his handler saying, why is this guy here? He's not the, he doesn't have the character, et cetera, as, as the, most of our prisoners do. Scott, give us a little clarity about what the governor is talking about, about these alleged crimes committed in jail, and also, uh, I'd like to note, and if you have any comment on it, fine. This guy is in the witness protection program in the jail, moved over and over and over again because his life is at risk. So that 32 years was not cush cush. That was a rough everyday worry about your life 32 years. Thoughts? Yeah, he was in um, what they call 23-1, uh, uh, meaning that you're in for 23 hours, you're out for one uh, for, you know, 25 years of those 32 years. So, you know, it was it was a, a very excessive incarceration. Um, what Governor DeSantis was referring to was a case that Rick unfortunately took. It was a slip up. Uh, he was arrested in 2005 from within the witness protection program in a Florida prison for taking, uh, I think it was like $8,000 to help uh, move a couple stolen cars that some of his fellow inmates had had their associates steal on the outside and were looking to uh, sell. And Rick helped them uh, help put some of those guys together with buyers in Detroit uh, to buy those stolen cars and ended up accepting, I think it was $6,000.
I'm, I'm not mitigating it. I mean, or I'm not trying to dismiss it. Rather, uh, it, it was a mistake, and uh, it was something that he that he owns, just like he owns the the fact that he was dealing drugs uh, as a as a teenager. But uh, you know, I, I don't think it really has any effect on the way people view him as a victim. And frankly, he as a political prisoner. I mean, it is what it is. He t he, he did the time. He got paroled from Michigan three years ago. He went and did three years in Florida, and, you know, now he's passed it. Yeah, 32 years on a law that no longer is on the books because of the draconian nature of it, with a juvenile on top of it, would seem to me to be an easy clemency charge, especially being locked down, you know, for 23 hours a day, which is really, really hard time. Uh, Scott, what changed ultimately that led to this clemency? Uh, he didn't get clemency. He just, he timed out in Florida. So he, he was sentenced to uh, uh, five years in Florida. He did three and got out for, you know, good behavior. Any takeaways from this for our political leaders that are, quote, unquote, tough on crime? And I was a tough prosecutor, but I always said, you got to use the rule of reason with cases. You have to be tempered. You just don't try to get as many years. You have to do something that deters the crime, but by the same token, take into consideration cooperation. And if I have two special FBI agents vouching for the guy, I mean, I just think that this was an extraordinarily excessive sentence. What can we do better? Well, I, I think it's something that you got to, you know, if you don't learn from history, you're deemed to repeat it or doomed to repeat it. Um, you know, Rick was the poster boy for the war on drugs in Detroit in the 1980s. He became a uh, an instant icon. When people say white boy Rick in Detroit, they immediately think of the crack era. And that's that's unfair. And I think that, you know, when people know the story, they realize there's so many different layers and so many different circumstances that led him to being the, the high profile figure that he was. And I mean, I, I just think it, it, it speaks to the lengths that we went to to disrupt, uh, you know, this, this ravaging of our communities during the crack era. And unfortunately, you know, the war on drugs is over and, you know, drugs won. And we lost. And and one of the biggest losers in that war was White Boy Rick, who who had to do uh, ha had to do a lot of time for the sins of others. Two years of juvenile offender, Scott Bernstein. It's outrageous. You did great investigative reporting. Thank you so much for bringing us to, uh, this story to light, and thank you so much for coming on the Law and Crime Network. Unfortunately, I wish I had so much more time to talk to you. But we've got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. This is about gangs, guns, and drugs. Many of the retaliations, the murders, the initial murder, it likely is about some beef between a gang and another gang, external or internal, and or having to do with the drug market. All right, that's the superintendent of the Chicago Police Department. So welcome back. After a shooting at a funeral in Chicago, it left 15 wounded. President Trump has announced a surge of federal troops due to the ongoing violence. Operation Legend was launched earlier this year in Kansas City, and Trump says troops will also go to New Mexico. However, local police say the violence is due to large issues. And uh, we want to go to the city council, David Moore in particular, in Chicago City Council, and listen to his point of view. These guns are not just coming from around the corner. They're not just coming from down uh, of the street. This is a national issue. How, are you hearing about on the news we arrested a large cartel that we've, uh, we've captured? Uh, our police are here getting guns off the street at the city level all day. But are you hearing the federal government saying, we stop this? No. And until that happens, they're just triaging. They just tri and doing their best. I'm telling you they are. But it's triaging. The federal government has to step up in a real way, because these guys are not just getting guns and drugs from around the country. Be a, don't be afraid to challenge those other countries where these um, drugs are coming from. But you're not hearing. You heard about El Chapo. Who have you heard since then? Have you heard that the whole kingdom and all this is being brought down? That's the real war. We're triaging. And we're triaging as best 
as we can. And until those things happen, you are going to see, it starts at the national level, that this stuff is going to continue because it's continuing in New York, not just Chicago. So it's not just like a Chicago issue. It's a national issue. All right. Well, listen, I got to start first with our first guest, Julie Rendleman. Rendleman the Great, a host of the Law and Crime Network, as well as a legal analyst, a former prosecutor of great repute, as well as an awesome defense attorney. Welcome to the show, Julie. It's been a while since I've seen you. How are you doing? Good to see you. I'm doing well. Julie practices out of New York. And then, of course, we have Mike Corbanix, who is a New Jersey Supreme Court certified criminal trial attorney out of Clifton, New Jersey. We work together as baby prosecutors and uh, throughout our careers, as well as the fact that we do defense work together. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bob. Good to see you. Hello, Julie. Hi, Mike. How are you? Good. Thanks. All right. So, guys, what do you what do you make of this? I mean, you know, I worked with state authorities and federal authorities when I had an individualized crime problem within my county. Um, and, and yes, the DEA and other federal agencies are trying to stop drugs coming in so on, so forth, and the other. But the fact is, crime is rampant in Chicago. Those poor citizens living in those communities, the majority of which are just trying to get by day by day, have to deal with this gang violence, shootings, children being killed, innocent children being killed. Something needs to be done. The problem is, I always think, it's a pendulum effect. If the police don't do anything, they're criticized for not doing something. If the police do something, they're criticized for overdoing it. Is President Trump right that at some point in time, and he kind of changed his tune a little bit, he, he didn't necessarily say he's going to surge forces in there now, but he wants those mayors and those governors to ask for the assistance. He's kind of taken a little bit more of a measured approach so that the federal authorities can go in there and clean up what is occurring there right now, today, with people dying and with drugs and guns and gang members, not, I kind of respectfully disagree with the gentleman who was just speaking before, the erudite idea that we have enough resources to eradicate the importation of drugs into this country, which we don't. Julie, ladies first. Uh, where do I begin? Um, so, you know, look, this isn't, for me, it's not a political issue in terms of whether Trump, you know, I hate, you know, whether I agree with Trump or not. In this situation, in terms of whether or not the federal government needs to be involved, in terms of the influx of violence and guns, drugs that are coming into various states, yes, there's a difference between the federal government um, and, and federal enforcement being involved with the everyday protests, I'm not sure that they're needed for that. However, the one distinction that seems to be offered in the Chicago situation versus what happened in Portland is the Fed. The Fed's plan to work with the U.S. attorneys in uh, Chicago. That's a little different. And every single day, um, you experience it, I experience it, Mike experiences, the federal government um, is involved with the you know investigations of high end you know gun and drug smuggling and conspiracy cases and that's what we're looking for from them i'm not sure that they're needed on a lower level yeah uh, well that's a really good point that julie brings up mike about working with the attorney general uh, the us attorney's office because while we had great investigators and street people that were able to eradicate drugs and guns and gangs the fact was, we just didn't have the resources and the horsepower that the U.S. Attorney's Office had. And I think what Julie's trying to say here in this dynamic is that this would be run not necessarily so much by the, the badge and gun side, but by the attorneys in the U.S. Attorney's Office in order to build cases against the high-level people uh, that otherwise maybe you don't have the resources to do. What do you think? Well, I agree with Julie. I mean, our experience shows us that, Bob. I've been I was involved in MS-13 cases where it started at a local county level, but it got so violent, the resources were so much needed that there was coordination. This, like anything in life, needs communication. You have to have an established plan, decide where you want your goal to be, and how do you get there? I've always seen, in these cases, the federal government working with local police departments who know the communities, who know the community relations, educate the feds as much as the feds educate the local police department. And when they work in unison, it's very, very effective. Yeah, unison is a great term, Mike, because it used to be back in the day that uh, law enforcement was siloed. They didn't want to share information. But after September 11th, 
uh, that dynamic went away and those agencies work symbiotically with one another, hand in glove. And like you said, the locals got the local information, the feds have the resources to get build somewhat bigger cases because of that. Well, as far as sending troops in at least, the New York City mayor, with respect to all things police, with respect to all things prosecution, criminal justice reform, with respect to all things Donald Trump, you may expect has a different point of view. Let's take a listen. So what we see in Portland is that the federal presence is actually making the situation worse, and we cannot allow that here in New York City nor anywhere else in the country. I want to be very, very clear that we will not allow this to happen in our city. And this could only make things worse, and I've sent this letter today to the Attorney General and to the Acting Homeland, Secur uh, Homeland Security Secretary, making clear formally that the presence of these federal officials, these federal officers, is not welcome here in New York City and is not needed here. I'm joining also with dozens of other mayors from around the country in sending a joint letter to these officials as well to make clear that none of our cities wants this intrusion. And I want to be clear, it is not about keeping our city safe or any of these cities safe because it's actually making the situation worse and more chaotic and more violent. I, 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 I just love the platitudes, Julie. In a certain sense, it's like bad cost, bad cost, bad, no this, no that. I'm not saying this point of view here is wrong, but then it always like has like a little bit of a hook. It's almost like a look, but we really like our cops. We really want them to protect our streets and, and we support the good ones. And, and that, it's almost like he kind of throws that out there because he has to. The bottom line here is, I'm just curious, does the president of the United States, let, let's go back to Portland for a minute. Portland was a disaster in my mind. Federal agents, no one knows who they are, or I'm not sure if we really know exactly who they are, but anyway, they come in there, mask, no identification, throwing people in vans that are unmarked and taking them off the street. I don't know if there was coordination with local law enforcement or not. If it wasn't, then that presented a huge danger to the law enforcement. So maybe it wasn't the right way to go about it. And maybe that's why the president's saying, invite us in so we can work with you. What do you think about the distinctions as to what went on in Portland and what we could do better in New York City? Julie? Uh, all right, all right, Mike. Well, Julie may be frozen, even though I'm told that she's down at the beach down the shore, so she can thaw out a little bit before we get back to her. Uh, what do you think about that, Mike? Well, Bob, I think we, we, what's going on here is we're talking apples and oranges when we talk about Chicago and Portland, in my opinion. Um, and so I think it's a very difficult comparison. But I think anything that needs to be anything that will be a different sort of law enforcement in that nature has to be coordinated. And according to the Supreme Court cases I've read, things of that nature is the states really need to request the federal input into their into their policing and things of that nature because of the quasi-sovereign nature of each state in our government. Right, explain that, you know, that you're right on the precipice. I, I don't know if you want to get in a really nuanced way, but it's something that gets brought about politically all the time and touches on police departments. That is the separation between federal and state. Remember, we always, we started our country in a state's rights position. The states were concerned about uniting because of a powerful federal government that they did not want, except for the limited circumstances of health, safety, and welfare. Obviously, the federal government has gotten much more expansive, but can you talk about what those constitutional principles are about when and when not a, a federal government can intervene in a state action? Well, you know, Bob, it, it's really not very clear because of the, the, the ever-changing structure of, of, of our government and, and things of that nature. But it's basically when the states need help, they ask you, is my understanding of it. And if they feel, a state feels that the federal government is intruding upon their rights as a sovereign for those people, or quasi-sovereign, as the Supreme Court calls it, for those people that state represents, then it's left, I think, to the interpretation of the Supreme Court or the federal court. Uh, Julie so it's Renleman, not clear cut. Julie Renleman is apparently thawed out there down at the beach and is back active and alive with us here at the Law and Crime Network. It's so good to have you back, Julie. Um, yeah, so, run to the ocean for a second. Just <laughs> run right back. I can't, can't blame you. Hey, so Julie, you were a, a, a prosecutor in New York. You were very good at what you did. You're a defense lawyer now. Uh, my question becomes, de Blasio doesn't want those federal troops in there. 
We just had the PBA president speaking on, I think, one of my last shows, at least on a video clip, where he was indicating that the mayor has said he's going to have a soft touch, quote unquote, with crime. Crime is skyrocketing in New York City. You are both a balanced person, having been a prosecutor and a defense attorney. What is the right messaging and approach right now in order to protect the citizens of New York City? So, I, you know, I think we all, anyone from New York recognizes, with all due respect to Mr. de Blasio, that he does have a tendency to talk out of both sides of his mouth. Um, you know, I, I think Cuomo actually, you know, kind of weighed in in regards to this. And, you know, Cuomo is no huge supporter of Trump, but what he does recognize, um, at the very least, is that there is a huge problem and a soft touch is not going to do it. And so, basically, what he's saying to de Blasio is, clean it up. If you don't clean it up, someone else is going to. And the truth is, is, you know, I support 100 percent police reform. I, I can't fathom someone that does not. However, police are still needed um, to keep our streets safe. Um, and so you need to let the community know that, you know, if they don't want guns on the street, if they don't want violence on the street, that there has to be some compromise in terms of the police working with them. Yeah, you know, in addition to the community, who else you got to send a message to? The criminals, who are now being told there's a soft touch and a backup of the police department. And that can only spell bad things for those poor folks that live in those communities. We got to go to break. We'll be right back. Uh, we have more on the story that's rocked the legal community and community in general across the country of the shooting death of Daniel uh, Andurl, who is the son of Judge Esther Salas and the son of Mark Andurl, who was a retired Essex County assistant prosecutor, tried many high profile murder cases. Uh, you may recall uh, the, a person posing as a Fed X driver. They opened the door. Uh, Daniel Ar uh, Andurl was shot in the chest and killed. Uh, Mark Andro was seriously wounded, but is in stable condition right now after undergoing a number of surgeries. Uh, and we found out in, in, in just like disbelief that Roy Dan, Dan Hollander, who is an attorney out of New York, was a suspect found dead in the Catskills by a self-inflicted gunshot wound. But it may not have been his only killing. He had a list of people in there. He is described as a, 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 a vapid anti quote unquote feminist and a very angry person who had some, some suggest mental health disorders and terminal cancer at the time. Let's listen to the North Brunswick mayor, Mark Womack, speaking about this absolutely tragic case. We continue to be somber in North Brunswick today, of course, uh, as a result of the shooting. Uh, Daniel Andrew, the son of uh, Esther Salas, our United States District Court judge. It was a strange day yesterday. Uh, we're glad to know that the uh, evil person who did these things has been identified and is not a threat, and that it was a single isolated incident. Let's all keep Mark Andrew and Judge Esther Salas in our thoughts and prayers today, throughout the day, as they continue to struggle. Mark, as he possibly undergoes another surgery, and Judge Salas, as she copes with the loss of her son. I mean, it could be nothing worse than obviously some maniac that decides to kill somebody, uh, you know, but they actually kill the son. They kill the love of that couple. And, and that's probably worse than death itself. You know, there were a lot of people on that list, including a high level judge in New York, as well as an individual, Mark uh, Angelucci. And Mark Angelucci, to me, guys, provides an interesting insight. He was kind of part of this men's rights thing and what we call anti-feminist. I don't know. I, I can't say he's part of that, but to, to try to bring more rights to men in, in legal cases. Well, he was on the list, too, because apparently he threw Hollander out of the organization. So this was just a gripe list that this guy had. It, Mike, I'm going to you first. I mean, because, you know, we we practice with these people. Uh, me and you have handled homicide cases as prosecutors, as defense attorneys. And we have to maintain a professional distance when we do that. Otherwise, you lose your mind in a job like this. But something like this really hits home. What have your feelings been like? It's been really, really tough, Bob. It's tough to discuss. I've, I've, I've tried cases in front of Judge Salas. Um, she, she's a great judge. Mark has always been a true professional. 
as a prosecutor, as a defense attorney, a very effective advocate on whatever side he's on, but always approachable, fair, open-minded. And to the passion they both had for the law, and their son was going to go to law school. That was what he was planning. And the passion they had for the law and the passion they had for just being part of of being part of the legal community. I, I just very one of very few times, Bob, I'm actually speechless and my heart is really sad. Yeah, Julie, it's it's hard when you work with somebody. Uh, I was in the Essex County Prosecutor's Office when Mark was an assistant prosecutor. I was an agent. Um, and, and you follow these people's careers and you know them. Uh, that's one thing. But, you know, I want to talk a little bit to the point that I don't think the public recognizes that prosecutors, judges and defense lawyers from disgruntled clients are in harm's way all the time. And it just seems to me in the decades long of my career that it's just getting worse. And, and the mental illness or the insanity that causes people to do the crazy that they do is not getting better. It, it's just getting more unbelievable. And to come from an attorney who knows the court system, I'm not saying attorneys are more special, they understand the adversarial process, they understand those kind of things. It's just shocking to know that it could be a lawyer that would do this. I just, what are your overall emotions about it? So I'm not sure that it's gotten worse. I think that we're just more aware of it. I think, obviously, in the advent of social media, we become aware of, you know, things that are, that are happening kind of at the moment they're happening. I think what's unique about this case, or not unique, is this is an attorney who was a practicing attorney who had such clear mental health issues and was a ticking time bomb. And no one was—and I'm not—I don't know who to blame. There might be some more other than—obviously, he's the person responsible, but who knows— at this point, whether there'll be a further investigation that indicates whether or not there were other individuals that may have known he was about to do something or that he, you know, needed to be looked at. I don't, obviously, we don't have those answers. But, you know, look, mental health is a huge issue in, in, in the United States. It's been an issue, and it's something that impacts the criminal courts as well, um, which is why it's so important to have that aspect be an element of cases. I, I, I think it's important to note here that he wrote like a 1700 page. You know, like manifesto or book, if you will. And you're right that uh, there were signs that were out there. We talk about this all the time. I I'm going to push back on you a little bit on, I don't know if it's different than it was. Well, having been in a homicide squad uh, 30 years ago as an assistant prosecutor, you saw the nature and quality of cases that came in. And they're typically dealing with gangs or drugs or domestic violence and marital relationships. Or, you know, you, you could put your arms around the motive of why the individuals did the bad things they did. Pushing forward years later, when I was the prosecutor in charge of the entire office, but the homicide squad, obviously, in particular, the nature of the cases was more twisted. It was, it was, there was less of a motive. The, a lot of it didn't make sense. And I think the advent of social media has exacerbated, has activated some of these individuals that um, would otherwise be under the radar, but now feel, hey, that guy did it. Let me do it. Let me have my 15 minutes of fame or whatever crazy psychological thing occurs. Julie, I'm sorry. I, I wanted you to respond to that, but I'm being told by the producers we got to take a quick break. <laughs> we'll be okay. right back. All right, welcome back to Law Crime Report. I'm Bob Bianchi, your host. We have Julie Rendleman and Mike Corbanix with us. So listen, uh, in front of me right now is kind of like a script, a breakdown that they tell us with the, regard to each story that we can reference to. And sometimes I have to read them literally word for word because they are so well-crafted. Jennifer Tinter from the Law and Crime Network, I'm giving you the credit for the kangaroo story. So welcome back. Subject of this next story hopped right into the hearts but the kangaroo culprit is now facing charges. The Fort Lauderdale police released this video of one of the most down under police chases. <laughs> it looks like, is he hurt in the front there? What do you want me to do? We were trying to push him in there, in the yard. No, but, 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 but. Who got a leash? I can't lasso is that. Where's my leash at? Who has my leash? Yeah, he was taking my actually have a front. Officer. It's okay, buddy. It's okay, buddy. Okay. Can you tighten that up though? You got we have that tight. I O R T I N O. We have it. We, we actually captured the camera. 
<laughs> well, we got to get it there, guys. So now what do we do? I guess we'll just we'll keep many. We'll keep them tied up. I don't know where the owner is. We just have. We have it. We we actually captured the kangaroo. Yes, we have captured the kangaroo. So now what do we do? No, we don't. We don't know where the owner is. We just have the kangaroo. I'll, I'll put him in my car. I am so happy I have this on body cam. This, Bob, in your how many years no, you've ever seen a kangaroo? I am so happy. Hey, Wes. Wes. Wes snap a Legs. Legs. All right, go. Go. I got him. I got his head. Okay. We, we gotta. We gotta worry about the tail. Hey, somebody get the car door behind me. The door. Oh, his tail. The door. Tight. His tail. Strong. Hold on, let me get his tail. I think it's his tail in there. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Get in there with him. Okay. Quick. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Get in there with him, Lori. Okay. Quick. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, it's not often that you hear police say they're happy they caught something on a body cam. And I love the way that they're, they're ducking the kangaroo's head in there so it doesn't get hurt. Obviously, following their, following their training. So the owner was located and is, is now charged for allowing a kangaroo to escape, not having how he got the kangaroo in the first place, and not having a license to, to own it. You know, listen, <laughs> Julie, um, there, there's nothing that you can't get charged for in this country. Now we got the kangaroo caper. What are your thoughts? Uh, uh, um, it, it, I'm glad that the police officers were gentle with the kangaroo. Um, yes. That's my thoughts. <laughs> yes, Michael. Could, had there been injury, you know, those officers, I don't, I don't, I'm sure they didn't go through training on how to capture a kangaroo out there in Fort Lauderdale, maybe an alligator or something. But uh, you know, Julie brings up a good point. You, it, God forbid the kangaroo got hurt, then the cops are going to be sued for you know malicious harm to a kangaroo. What do you think? Well, I don't want to jump around too much on this subject, Bob, but uh, <laughs> I think, I hope he gets a fair trial and doesn't wind up in some kangaroo court. <laughs> oh, Mike Corbanek's bringing the puns. We I expect. Know, um, so, Julie, listen. As a prosecutor, what do you what do you do? The guy doesn't have a license. I don't know if it's a, it's a slap on the wrist, right? Let the guy do what he's got to do to register his poor kangaroo and let him let them both live in uh, peace happily thereafter. No. Yeah, I, I, I mean, look, there's certain exotic animals that aren't supposed to be kept in your home. I'm not exactly sure what the law is in Fort Lauderdale. I'm guessing that a kangaroo is probably, you know, not the best pet to have in your home. Um, but do I think he's going to jail on this case? No, I don't. And, and Mike, we were laughing before we went on set with this, but it's no joke with this kind of an animal. I mean, kangaroos are boxers by definition in, in the real sense of the word. You were actually talking about that. And, you know, you get a, a nasty kangaroo who's, who's upset, and when they're coming at that officer, there's a serious risk at that point. Well, I, I can't speak from experience on this one, Bob, but um, it, isn't this the way the uh, Lion King started out with one or two exotic animals and look where it got him? So, uh, I don't know. This is interesting, and at least nobody was hurt, but it's a very bizarre situation. I don't know if that makes me a bad person. Uh, Julie, in a, in a nutshell, um, are you pro kangaroo owner, anti kangaroo owner? I'm going to, by the way, Mike's on a roll today, so I almost, I'm hoping that he has one more line in him. Um, but uh, I, I'm going to say probably anti kangaroo. That's my guess. Anti I, don't know so you... I, don't, I don't know kangaroos personally very well, so I don't have an opinion uh, so fully. You want to go down on the record forever as being anti kangaroo. Is that what I'm hearing? I am. I'm pro uh, kangaroo, anti kangaroo owner. Uh, okay. How about you, Mike? I'm just trying to figure out how the owner didn't know his kangaroo was missing. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, guys, I, I, I don't know either. But um, once again, it, it's a story that shows you of the diversity of things that police officers have to do when they're out there. And I'm sure those cops didn't wake up that day and say, I'm going to have to somehow a kangaroo. So, Jennifer, thank you for the great write-up and the laugh. Uh, Julie and Mike, it's always awesome to have you both back on. As you know, the law uh, crime report is on Tuesday. I'll be back next Tuesday. We'll be back tomorrow.